All right, stay with me here. Superheroes and professional wrestlers have a lot in common with you and me, right? Perhaps they have a lot more spandex in their wardrobe. But what we all share is that we all get to fail miserably. And that gives me hope. Now I want to explain that with two stories. The first starts November 17th, 1996, in a sold out Madison Square Garden in New York City. 18,000 fans are on their feet, and they're witnessing the debut of a much hyped rookie sensation. Now they're not cheering for anyone in the New York Knicks or the New York Rangers, they're not cheering for Whitney Houston, they're there for someone else. His father and his grandfather were heroes in their time, but this is his time. He comes down, arms outstretched, an electrifying smile on his face. The tight, wet curls on his head bounce to the rhythm of his walk. Blue and green tassels flail about from his Samoan-inspired necklace. This is the 1996 Survivor Series, presented by the World Wrestling Federation. His name is Rocky Maivia, and by all accounts, including his own, he looks like a total doofus. <laughs> now, 10 years later, in New York City, a best friend and I decide that we want to make a, a feature film. So we get together and we write a two-hour screenplay, and we love it. Now, we're not filmmakers. We are just regular TV editors working in New York City, but we have dreams, and this is going to be our way out. So we take the script, we're really proud of it, and we shop it around to some people who might want to finance the production. We don't get any bites. Undeterred, we decide we're going to raise the money ourselves, and we're going to produce this film with our own money and some of our parents' money. So we scrape together a small cast. We get some young actors. And for the next year and a half, we make a movie called Sneakers and Soul, and we're very proud of it. This, to us, was going to be the next indie film success story. Now, decades before all of this, a man named Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in this book, he outlines basically a story trope that he calls the hero's journey. And what he suggests is that for millennia, people have been telling pretty much the exact same story of a hero who goes on a quest and undergoes some transformative victory to come out to be a better person. Now, cultures across the world, cultures that had never met each other, have been telling the same story somehow. So basically, like from the Old Testament to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, or from Homer's Iliad to Avengers Endgame, we've basically been telling the exact same story of this transformative hero's quest. Now, just like these ancient narratives, Filmmakers of today are using the same storytelling structure to craft their screenplays. They're using a three-act structure, actually, that has been designed to engage an audience, build drama, and ultimately deliver a happy ending. So let's talk about Act One of the hero's journey. In Act One, we're introduced to our hero. This could be a regular person. Usually, it's someone just like you and me. It might be even be someone who's down on their luck. But this hero has their life changed when they're given a quest. Maybe a special characteristic is revealed in them. Maybe they're gifted a superpower. Whatever it is, they're told that they have some greater purpose in life, whether it's the farm boy who discovers that his father was once a great Jedi, or the boy who lives under the stairs is told that he's actually a wizard, or the curious island girl decides that she wants to venture out into the ocean and return the heart of Tefiti. This is act one of the hero's journey. Now, back in the WWF, Rocky Maivia was introduced to the crowd, and he had some success at first, but then not so much. Pretty quickly after his debut, fans saw this smiling, baby-faced character and it was just too much for them. The fa wrestling fans of the 1990s, they wanted edge, and they wanted authenticity, they wanted attitude, and Rocky Maivia was not bringing it. Instead, they turned on him, 
And every arena he went to, he would face more and more boos. They couldn't stand him. And he would hear chants, die, Rocky, die, or Rocky sucks. Now, this guy was supposed to be the future of professional wrestling. He was a third-generation superstar, and fans could care less. In fact, they hated him. Within a year, he suffered a really bad knee injury. He was sidelined, and they sent him home. So this son of a champion, this grandson of a high chief, was back at home. He fell into a deep state of depression. He was rejected and injured. And he was rethinking his future as a professional wrestler. In Act 2, our heroes seem to have all they need, right? But we can't make it that easy on them. We have to throw them a curveball. And so what do screenwriters do in Act 2? They introduce a villain. And that villain, like the hero, can take many forms. It can be a person who's actively preventing the hero from fulfilling their quest. It could be the hero's inner turmoil or some other challenge or conflict that's preventing them. It might be the storm that's coming to de destroy the island. It could even be a shark that's eating the tourists. It could be unbearable stage fright. Whatever it is, in Act 2, we learn that it's too much for our hero. And that's where they suffer a brutal defeat. That's where they fail. As for our film, there was that fleeting success. We were accepted in some film festivals. We won some awards. That was great. But if you've ever been to a film festival, you know that the point of this festival is to sell your film. Basically, you make indie films, you bring them to the festival, and you're like, hey, does anyone want to buy this? You're looking for distributors who want to like, put your film in theaters. They're going to pay for the promotion. They're going to pay to get these films out all across the country. They're going to launch your career as a filmmaker. But if you've ever tried to sell something, you know what it takes to pitch that product to a potential buyer. Confidence. This is a beautiful sweater. You should buy this sweater. I know because I make great sweaters. Or download this app. This is a really cool app. It'll help you in so many ways because I make great apps. Or distribute this film. It's a really great film. Trust me, because I know how to make great films. But it was there that I recognized this hero's fatal flaw. A paralyzing lack of self-confidence despite me being up here and what it looks like right now, I was just broken in this place. And here I was, tens of thousands of dollars into a project. And I had no confidence. The fatal flaws don't end there, though. I also suffer from severe anxiety and massive depressive disorder. On top of all this, the week we found out that our film had been accepted into its first film festival, my father passed away from pancreatic cancer. So, yeah, confidence wasn't really my thing. And I was here at parties with distributors and with filmmakers and with agents, and I was completely powerless. I was not ready for Act Two, and I was not ready for that villain called Self-Doubt. We left the film festivals, I didn't sell my movie. I didn't launch my career as a filmmaker. I didn't even make another movie after that. I thought it was over. All of this follows Joseph Campbell's Act Two perfectly. The hero has to struggle. The hero has to fail. Because it's not their time. It might be their destiny, but it's not their time yet. Now, Act Two doesn't end there, though. No. There are two distinct parts of Act Two. Yes, the hero fails. But the second part is the training montage. Now, the training montage is that part of the movie where the hype track starts and we get to see this, this, the, the, the star of the film start working on himself. If it's a Rocky movie, right? If we've all seen a Rocky movie before, this is the part where maybe he's running through the streets of Philadelphia with his fans falling behind him. Or it's the makeover scene, right? In a movie with like, the ugly duckling gets transformed into a beautiful swan to recognize her full potential. That's the training montage scene too. No matter what, in these training montage scenes, what we're doing is we're finding what wasn't working for our hero and we're rebuilding them. 
we're ironing out all the wrinkles, we're finding the things that the, the villain exploited, all the weaknesses that the villain exploited in Act 2, we're building those into strengths. Now, in the WWF, Rocky Maivia gets his own training montage. When he was at home sidelined with an injury, he got some sage advice from some wrestling veterans. They said, Rocky, you've got everything it takes. Just be your authentic self. But super powered, right? He said, OK, that sounds good. I'll just do that. Easy enough. But he went back and he tweaked his character a little bit. And months later, he came back to the WWF. But this time, he wasn't the smiling baby face that fans had rejected. Nope. He wasn't even called Rocky Maya V anymore. Now, he was the rock. Now, he had the confidence that he always needed. He was that brash, audacious powerhouse. He was a man who was there to take what he wanted and make no apologies. He had transformed himself. Now, as you probably know, there's no actual person named The Rock, just like there wasn't a person named Rocky Maivia. These are characters portrayed by one person, Dwayne Johnson, right? And much like the personas in professional wrestling, the matches are, uh, let's just say, like dramatic interpretations of reality. <laughs> They're not fake, though. We don't use the F word in professional wrestling. <laughs> no. We use a different word, and that's kayfabe. And I love this word kayfabe. It's one of my favorite words. Kayfabe, as wrestling historians point out, began back in the early 20th century. No one really knows who invented the word, but it turns out that carnival workers would use the phrase to describe any like rigged games or events that they had. And the art of scripted fighting began as a kayfabe event. It was a rigged like, you know, showcase of two guys pretending to beat each other up because it's a lot more fun to not hurt each other than it is to hurt each other. So what the fighters were told was, keep it kayfabe. Keep your punches kayfabe. And this word remained in the wrestling business and it's still used today. And they use the word to refer to any part of the story that's, the, that's performance. So like, wrestlers could get hurt in kayfabe, or they might get married in kayfabe. They'll turn good or turn evil all in kayfabe. Kayfabe is that make-believe part of the show that us fans choose to believe in. We willingly suspend our disbelief for kayfabe. Back in the filmmaking world, I was down and I was depressed. We seem to have failed, but it's still act two, right? And what happens when our hero is beaten down in the dust and seemingly overpowered by that adversary? What happens in Act 2? We get a training montage. training montage. That's right. So I got my own training montage. I trained. I went to grad school. I presented projects in class. I demoed some projects that I made. I gave presentations. I gave a thesis presentation and I got used to this sort of thing. It wasn't just training, I also refocused my aim. I thought, what if filmmaking wasn't the end of my story? What if there was another end of the story? What could be my act three? So I thought about filmmaking, and I distilled it down to some core values. What did I love about it? I love storytelling, I love creativity, I love performing for an audience, where else can I put these skills to work? And then it hit me. Just like Dwayne Johnson had transformed himself into The Rock, I built my kayfabe persona. And I realized that Marty is not the hero of this story. I needed a kayfabe persona, and that was going to be Mr. B, the school teacher. <laughs> That's right. So see, in Act 3, We've now prepared our hero for that final battle with the villain. We built them up. We told them they were special and then watched them fail so they can learn, so they can evolve, so they can find the real key inside that's going to help them turn into the hero they were always meant to be.
So when they step up to the plate, when they step into the ring, when they go into that job interview, whatever it is, yes, they've been defeated before. They're facing this villain that overpowered them. It's the same villain. But in Act 3, they have the tools and they have the skills that weren't there in Act 2. And what do they do? They use these new skills, they find their new persona, and they defeat the villain. And that's what we get in Act 3. As for me, I got my own Act 3. I moved down to Georgia, and I was hired by a high school to teach filmmaking. Now, I had not stepped into a classroom since I was a student. And I was still the same self-conscious, nervous, anxious person that I always was. But this time, I had my kayfabe persona. This time I had someone else to rely on to do the heavy lifting for me in this situation. And guess what? It went pretty well. Within a year, we transformed the program. We started hosting film festivals. We were partnering with local production companies. We were producing work that the students, their parents, the teachers, other administrators never even expected us to pull out. We were doing incredible things. We were getting industry recognition across the country getting our stuff into other people's film festivals. It, we were going on field trips to New York. It was, it was great. We were so proud of this. That, friends, is the hero's journey in three acts. Act one, you identify your hero and their quest. Act two, let them fail and develop. And then act three, they triumph and they celebrate. So now, I want you to think about the hero's journey for yourself. When did you fail? Then I want you to remember that there are three acts to a story. Perhaps that failure wasn't act three. Perhaps that wasn't the end of your story. Perhaps that was the middle of your story. That's what hit me when I thought about my journey in life. Now here's the key. When you go through your act two, when you go through your training montage, you have no idea if that training has prepared you for that final battle with the villain. You have no idea if these tools that you gained are actually going to help when you face this villain that's already defeated you once. But you know what? That suspense, that's drama. We've just hooked an audience. We've just made them care about the stakes for this character. And all of this is going to make that triumph more emotional because we watch this person fail. We watch them learn from their mistakes. We watch them become super powered and then we, we saw them win. That's the emotional victory that we get at the end of the hero's journey. And I believe that's what it takes in life as well. We can do all the training we want. Dwayne can go home. He can come up with a new name for himself. He can lift weights. He can change the way he talks and the way he looks. He can shave his head. It doesn't matter. When he doesn't matter until he steps into that ring and faces those same fans that booed him and rejected him once already. But what does he have now? He has his kayfabe persona. He has the super-powered version of himself to rely upon. So what I suggest to you is think about your kayfabe persona. What does that person look like? What do they sound like? How do they talk? How do they act? What do they wear? That's the person that you can follow into that ring. You must persist. You must push on. You must find your hero skills and develop them. You should not be afraid. You should not be afraid of being afraid either, because that's perfectly normal to be afraid of being afraid. You should build your kayfabe persona and you should let them lead you to victory. Thank you very much.